Amen. Amen. For the rest of you still standing, you can grab a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cookie. What a morning. Oh my gosh. Be honest with me. Talk to me. Is that, was that helpful for you? It really moved me to see just the participation and whether you're up front or you're, you're uh, in the stands, I just want to thank you guys for engaging because right now, I mean, these are the days when we got to move from spectating to participating in what God is doing. Amen. And he is doing so much in our midst. Hey guys, welcome to Love Church. Let's give it up one more time for those who are new for the first time. If you are a first time guest, can you raise your hand? Any first time guests? Awesome. Second row. Super cool. Very bold. Glad that you're here. I won't bring you up on stage today. Don't, don't worry, but so grateful that you guys, but seriously, you know, sometimes it's, you never know what you're going to get with churches. Some, some Christians are kind of weird. For whatever reason, Pastor Todd's allowed me to preach today. So if you don't like the message today, come back next week. Yeah. So come back next week. But seriously, I'm super grateful for you, Pastor Todd and, and Denise. You guys are the best. Can we give it up for our amazing leaders? This awesome pink shirt. Ready to serve and love kids later today. Uh, we're a very simple church. I know uh, Pastor Matt and Pastor Ben shared that during, during host time today, but we, we're all about, like our biggest MO here at Love Church, genuinely our motivation, is that you would experience God's best for your life. And it's hard to know what God's best for any of our lives is if we don't go to God's instruction manual. So here's what I want to tell you. Guess what? I'm going to teach you guys today from the word of God, but here's my invitation. You go and you check everything that I'm saying and you say, you know what? I'm not just going to depend on what the pastor said. I'm going to go to the word of God myself because God wants to speak to you on your own this week. Can I get an amen? Is somebody awake today? Is somebody ready to hear the voice of God for themselves? He wants to speak to you. And let me tell you, when you catch a word from God, it'll change everything in your life. I haven't even introduced myself yet. My name is Pastor Cap Chatfield, by the way. Hi, good to meet you. Good to see you, Kevin. I'm the online pastor of Love Church. I have the privilege of overseeing our online campus, and we're, we have a lot of people who are making decisions for Christ every week online. Let me tell you guys, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. And let's not take for granted what God has given us. There's people all over the world who join the Love Church online community who say, Cap, I don't have, I don't have a church near me that preaches the Bible. I don't have a church near me that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's not become too familiar with what God is doing in this church that we miss it and take it for granted. Because what God has given us is really something special. And we've opened up our, uh, our campus to those online. So if you're tuning online, we love you. So glad that you're here. And let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat, please. Now, please join me in turning to John chapter six as we prepare for the, the Bible study. I feel like, are you guys just kind of depressed from the Cornhuskers game? Is that why, like, the mood? Hey, I'm, hey, this is coming from a guy who does, is not even from here natively. I'm, actually, I'm rooting for the Huskers this year, guys. This is gonna be a good year. I won't, I won't tell you guys that I'm also a Miami Hurricanes fan. Oh, did I just say that out loud, so. We're gonna have fun in church today. Because God is fun. Our God is a happy God. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you so much. Yes, that's what I need. I need some water parched thank you thank you lord for casey the water boy thank you for the water of the word hello as though my mouth might get dry i might get thirsty lord there's a there's a well that we can drink from from which we will never thirst again and so we want to be we want to be refreshed by your word today we want to be refreshed by the water of your word I pray for clarity. I pray for people that have come in today with confusion. Just getting, just thanks so much, man. Appreciate it, David. Who are walking in just trying to figure out how to navigate through life, how to navigate through the culture. I pray, God, that your word, as you promised, would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Illuminate the way for us. We thank you, Lord, in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Did you know? 
that the devil has a plan for your life. You're like, honey, I think we showed up at the wrong church today. <laughs> I know, it, it, it's, it's a freaky statement, but there's a movie that my friend KB just uh, introduced me to called Nefarious. Anybody here ever seen this movie, Nefarious? We have a few people. Hey, I'm not a big horror movie guy. I, I actually wouldn't recommend horror movies in general, but this, was, this, this is an interesting movie that just came out. It's a Christian horror movie, which sounds like an oxymoron, right? So this movie's on Amazon Prime, if you have Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime and you can, and you can stomach a, a, a story like this, I'd recommend going and watching it because this movie is extremely enlightening to how, how the devil operates in the culture. Let me explain what the movie's about. The movie's about this guy named Edward who's on death row. And he's in this prison, and it's like literally the day of his execution. And 11 o'clock p.m., he's, about, he's going to go to the electric chair for all of these different murders that he's committed. But on the day of his execution, there's an appointment set with a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist comes in, really, to, to do one thing, and, and it's to evaluate whether or not this guy has actual mental competency enough to know what he did was wrong. If the man is not insane, he's going to the electric chair. But if the man is insane, that's basically his scapegoat out of this situation. So the whole story is about this psychiatrist coming in and interviewing this guy. And as soon as the, as soon as the psychiatrist comes in and starts interviewing this guy, he's in like a, this um, isolated unit, solitary confinement. The guy, the guy Edward starts talking to the psychiatrist and he has like this kind of like weird tick to him and he's like, I'm a demon. And you can tell the psychiatrist is like, okay, yes, so you're crazy, right? So he's like writing down all of these notes. But what's interesting is as the conversation goes on, what, you, what the psychiatrist, it's like you can tell the psychiatrist is having this dilemma. The psychiatrist comes in as an atheist. He's not a believer in the supernatural. But he's talking to this guy, and now he's starting to question everything because the, the, guy, who, the guy who is claiming that he's demonized is starting to unfold for him, is telling him the plan that he had to demonize this guy, Edward, who's basically the shell that he's encapsulating. Can I read for you what he says specifically? This is, this is how he describes demonizing this guy, Edward. So the psychiatrist is like, okay, so how, how, what happened? One day, like, Edward just woke up and you possessed the guy? And the demon, the demon's name is nefarious inside this guy named Edward. And the demon says, no, it doesn't work like that. He says it works through a series of yeses. You see, what happened was it started with, with this guy, Edward, started with him saying yes to stealing something that didn't belong to him when he was about three years old. Later, it went on to him saying yes to watching something that he shouldn't have watched on the internet or in a, in a movie. And it, over time, it's, it, it became him saying yes to playing with a Ouija board. And, and it was all of these, if you don't know what a Ouija board is, it's like this, it's this game that the world would wanna sell you as, it's just entertainment, it's just fun, but if you play with this game, you can channel spirits, you can channel the, the spirits of your deceased loved ones, and you can start to communicate with them. And that's, the, that's exactly what the devil would want us to believe is that it's just a game, it's just entertainment. And so what happens over time with this guy, Edward, is one yes after another yes after another yes, the devil is encroaching upon Edward's life. What became, what started off as external influence became internal possession and then became total subjugation. This guy, Edward, had no control over what was going on in his life. This demon nefarious also starts to explain his plan for the culture. And he was explaining how this whole legion of demons, this like Satan's, Satan's one MO, because Satan, you know, Satan, can I just tell you something? When you see those memes on Facebook or Instagram where you have the devil over here and you have Jesus over here and it's like a UFC card and they're like fighting one another, let me tell you something. The devil and Jesus are not on the same playing field. The devil is a created being, and Jesus, our God, is the creator. He is above and not below. He is the alpha and the omega. Nobody holds a candle to our God. 
But here's what's so, what's so interesting about the way that the devil operates and what he communicates in this movie. There's this guy, there's, there's a priest that comes in. The priest comes in to basically, the psychiatrist calls the priest in basically to get some theological counsel. He's not really sure how to deal with this guy. And as soon as the guy, as soon as Edward, who has the demon, hears that the priest is coming in, Edward starts freaking out. He's like, don't let the priest in. But as soon as the priest comes in and discloses, actually, I don't really believe in demons anymore. We've actually evolved from that in our faith. As soon as the priest says this, you can tell that the demon is codified. The demon's like, oh, so you, you don't believe in this anymore? Let me tell you, this is exactly how the enemy wants to operate in our culture these days. The most dangerous enemy is an enemy, enemy undetected, is a snake in the grass that you can't see. And what the devil wants to do is the devil wants to whisper to us and whisper to the culture, pulling us further away from God's design for marriage, pulling us further away from God's design for parenting, pull us further away from, from, God, from the sanctity of the life in the womb. This is the devil's plan for the culture these days. And what the devil has tricked us in believing is we have actually been liberated by pursuing this plan. That the further we move away from God's restrictive design, we've actually become free. But little did we know, we've actually fallen deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper through a series of yeses into the enemy's hand. Let me tell you, in a culture that is deceived, you and I, if we're gonna survive, if we're gonna succeed in this culture today, we need to learn how to be directed by the word of God and by his spirit. Here's what I wanna read for you guys, because you might be thinking, oh my gosh, Cap, this is a lot to handle. I got some good news for you guys. You wanna hear some good news? Here's the good news. John chapter 10, verses one through five says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of stranger. Let me tell you, the devil has a plan for your life, but God has a greater plan for your life. Can I get an amen from somebody today? The devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil wants to deceive, and the devil will do whatever he can to distract you and me from receiving the word of God in our lives. But if we can hold fast to the voice of our shepherd, you and I do not need to be destroyed. You and I can come out on top. Jesus promised this in his word. He says, you are the head and not the tail. The devil is underneath your feet and not the other way around. You and I do not need to be afraid of the enemy. The enemy is terrified of you. But the question is, do you understand the authority that you have? Do you understand the power that you have in this culture? If we do not know how to hear the voice of God on a daily basis, you and I, we're gonna be powerless. But here's the promise. The promise is that you and I were destined to hear the voice of God on a day-to-day -day basis. You and I were destined to be able to discern the attacks of the enemy, to discern the lies of the enemy, and move forward and take ground and set captives free for the kingdom of God. That is God's promise for you and for me. How to get direction from God. Here's the three things I want you to write down, the three points that we're gonna cover today. Number one, if you really wanna hear from God's voice, We need to not depend on signs. Write that down. We cannot depend on signs. We'll talk about that more shortly. Number two, if we wanna get direction from God, we need to become, become addicted to bread and wine. Someone's like, bread and wine? That sounds pretty good. Just hold on. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. But I'm glad I got your attention. Number three is we need to stay unoffended 
If we want to get direction from God, we need to stay unoffended. Don't depend on signs. Become addicted to bread and wine and stay unoffended. We're in the Gospel of John. If you're not familiar with the Gospels, here's why the Gospels are so powerful. The Gospels are eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. You see, Jesus is, is, the, is the focal point of the entire Bible. What, now that we are in the Gospels, we are reading about the life of our Savior, of our Shepherd, and, and the life that he lived, the things that he did, and the things that he said from a first-person perspective. But what's interesting about the book of John versus the other books is John, in his account of the gospel of Jesus, he's focusing on something that the other, the other guys, they kind of touched on, but John is really hitting this point home. Jesus is God in the flesh. This is the big deal, y'all, because a lot of times we think of Jesus as just this teacher. He's just this, he, he's another way to God. He's another moral a moral compass. He's somebody that we can follow. He's a great example. But John is trying to make a very emphatic point through this gospel. Jesus is not like everybody else. He's different. He's not another option on the menu. Jesus is the menu. Jesus is the word. He starts off his account in the book of John that Jesus is the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word came among us. Jesus, the son of God, came from from heaven to planet earth to live amongst you and me, to live the life that you and I could never live, to die the death that you and I deserve, to raise himself from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit, and to give us that same access to God the Father that he has. So how did he prove this? So Jesus went around and he did a ton of miracles. Let me tell you some of the miracles that Jesus did. We see right before this area of scripture, Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. That's the first documented miracle that we see. The second thing that we see is Jesus is feeding the multitude of 5,000 people. You remember the story. They're all following him through the wilderness. There wasn't enough food to feed everybody. So what did they do? Jesus is like, okay, who's got, who's got something to feed these people? And this little boy brings up five loaves of fish and, or five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus takes this and he, he gives thanks for it and he multiplies it and he's able to feed the 5,000 people. So much so that everybody got their fill and there were even leftovers after. Come on, somebody. We serve a God of abundance who wants, you ever go to a party and there's just like not enough food for everybody and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, we gotta call a pizza or something. Any party that Jesus shows up to, there is more than enough. The next thing, Jesus walks on water. He's on the He's on the sea. His, his disciples are in the boat. He comes up on the sea, literally walking on water. And we know the story that he invites Peter onto the water with him. So what's wild to me is after all of these things, all of these things that the disciples see, what you'd think that they'd be convinced. How many people in your life have you shared your faith with? And, and, and you're like, man, Jesus did this amazing thing in my life. And let me tell you what Jesus wants to do in your life. And the answer, the response that people give is, if I saw God come down from heaven to planet earth and do a miracle before my eyes, then I would believe him. I was that person for the longest time. The irony is, is that a lot of the people who are sharing that, inviting someone into that faith, they are a walking miracle. The people around you knew who you were before you encountered Jesus, and now you're not the same anymore. So let me ask you this question. Is the sign enough? Is the sign actually enough to believe in Jesus? This is what it says in John chapter 6, verse 30. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. I want you to check this out. This is what Jesus says in a different gospel. Matthew 16, verse four. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Guys, I'll be honest, I'll be honest. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, how do I say this? I'm not trying to be mean. Because I understand that we have a lot of people in different levels and phases of our faith. I'll tell you, like, when I first got saved, like, my number one MO after I got saved in college was I'm going to find me a Christian honey. <laughs> anybody else, can anyone attest to that? Anybody, like, 
You get saved and you're like, okay, now I'm gonna find God's best for my life in the form of a, of a cutie with blonde hair and green eyes. And I found mine, it took me a few years, but. <laughs> but what's so wild, I'll tell you this, anybody here who's ever been in like youth ministry or college ministry, <laughs> dude, as soon as you see a young buck get saved, it's like, oh my gosh, of course, your wife just happens to show up the next day at Runza. And she's like, it, it's like, it's so wild to me. Like time and time again, of the young guys I disciple, they're like, I found her, she's the one. She was the one. I was praying and I opened up my Runza and I took a bite out of my Runza and the Runza looked like Jesus. Like the bite mark looked like Jesus. And as soon as I looked up through the bite mark in my Runza, I see her with her Runza visor on and her hair back. And I said, that's the one. <laughs> Y'all are laughing, but you know we do this. Whether it's a Runza or it's a Pringle or it's a, a toast or it's like looking at the clouds. Hey, by the way, signs are good. Signs are actually good and signs are biblical. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gives us a list of signs that we need to pay attention to that are showing that he's coming back very soon, right? He's talking about there's gonna be famines, there's gonna be wars and rumors of wars and lawlessness will increase and the love of many will grow cold and the gospel will be preached to every nation. These are signs that Jesus wants us to look to, but the sign doesn't point to itself. The sign points to the word. The whole point of the sign is to point us to the word. I'm all for signs. Sometimes God will give us signs to confirm to us what he's already said. But if we are looking just for signs and we're not looking to the blatant scripture, the blatant direction that God wants to give us, we're gonna be deceived. The devil's just looking for people with a pure motivation but an unwillingness to go to the source. I don't know how many, like, I, I, I mean, this is gonna sound really bold, I'm just, but I'm gonna call a spade a spade. I really believe that's how cults are started. I mean, how many people do you know that are in a religion that, you know, we don't agree with what they agree, uh, with what they believe. They have the best intentions, but they're following, they're chasing signs whether signs in the stars, astrology, whatever. And it's like, no, we got, we got the map right here. We got the source right here. This will tell you what every, every meaningful sign is supposed to point to. So here's my encouragement to you guys. We accept signs, but we don't depend on signs. If we wanna be directed through this culture and discern what's right and what's wrong, we don't depend on signs. Number two, we become addicted to bread and wine. You are ready for this, here we go. I'm gonna read this, I'm gonna try to, I wanna just jump and read this scripture real quick. I know it's, it's gonna be a little bit of reading, so hold tight, but there's, there's an importance to this. Verse 34, sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus is talking about bread from heaven that will never run out. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all of those he has given me. If you feel like you're drifting from God, let me tell you, God's will for you is never to drift too far. God wants to keep you in the family of God. God is committed to finishing what he began in you. Verse 40, for it is my father's will that all those who see his son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say I came down from heaven? They became too familiar with him. They couldn't receive what he was saying. Watch this, verse 43. But Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said, for no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes 
to me. Guys, what I'm preaching right now, I'm basically preaching myself out of a job. Guys, pastors and teachers, we are, they are a gift to the body of Christ. I don't want to minimize the role that God has given me or Pastor Todd or Pastor Mike or, or Pastor Josh. What we get to do is such a privilege, but it is never to be a replacement for your direct access to God. That's why we're so freaky about getting people into their own Bibles, because God actually wants to speak to you himself. Check this out. This is what it says. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 20, 26 through 27, I am writing these things to you to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. Come on, somebody. You get direct access. No middleman, no mediator. You get the pure stuff right from the head honcho. Go directly to him. He wants to speak to you. Jesus goes on in verse 46. This is what he says, or this is what the scripture said. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I who was sent from God have seen him. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Jesus is talking about the Israelites who were taken from Egypt on their way to the promised land. And what did God do? He literally rained manna from heaven. It was their daily bread. God fed them on their way to receive the inheritance of this promised land. Verse 48, yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh? This is getting kind of weird, Jesus. What are you talking about here? Verse 52. He'll, watch this. He'll, he'll bring it around. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Someone's like, yo, you talking about cults? This sounds like a cult right here. This is crazy. And I will raise that person at the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me and the same way anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. What the heck is Jesus talking about? You can tell that a lot of people are getting confused in the scriptures as he's saying these sorts of things. But what I love about Jesus is that if you stick around long enough, anything that he walks you through, anything that he tells you to do, he will make sense of it if you are willing to endure. What happened the night before Jesus was crucified? He had his friends, he had all these disciples around the table and he, he performed this, the, Passover, the Passover supper with them. And what did he do? He instituted the communion. What was that? He took this bread and he broke this bread. And he said, this bread is a picture of my body, which will be broken for you on this cross. Eat this, every time you eat this, eat this in remembrance of me. And he took the wine, he poured the wine, he said, this wine in this chalice represents my blood, which is poured out for you, representing a new covenant. The new covenant being that you're not earned, you don't earn your relationship with God by your works, but by the finished work of what Jesus did for you on the cross. He said, every time you eat this bread, and you drink this wine, remember me. I wanna tell you something. This couple right here, the bread and the wine, we see, we, see, we see something very powerful in scripture over and over and over again. This couple right here, these two things, this is the key to victory in every area of your life as a believer. Here's how. Jesus says in, in John chapter four, he says, my people will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
We know that the bread represents the word of God. The wine represents the power of the Holy Spirit. You see the couple of the law and the prophets. You have Elijah and Moses who are standing with Jesus at the, great, at the transfiguration moment. What we see throughout scripture is this pattern of it's not about all word. We're just about the word and we don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit or it's all about the Holy Spirit and we're gonna do away with the word because the word is archaic. No, it's not even a balance. It's the fullness of both. If we're going to worship Jesus, we need the fullness of both. Here's what I've heard some famous, uh, some really great pastors say in the past. Any church that is built on all word and no spirit will dry up. Any church that's built on no word and all spirit will blow up. But any church that's built on all word and all spirit will grow up. This is why we're so passionate about, about where God has taken us. And we, we are a church that is grounded in the word of God. We are a church that says, God, we understand that you will never contradict what you say in these scriptures. But we also know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God is constantly speaking. God is constantly trying to give direction for you and for me. But the question is, are you and I spiritual enough to receive what he wants to say to us? The reason why these people couldn't receive it is because they were carnal in their thinking. They could only discern the world by what they could see and what they could hear with their natural senses. But Jesus is saying, if you would cry out for spiritual things, I will direct you in every matter. I will not let you wander. I will not let you follow the voice of a counterfeit. I will direct you and lead you to green pastures and to still waters. My question to you right now is, when was the last time you asked God for a word for what you're going through? It's so easy to go to a friend. It's so easy to go to Google. But I'm telling you, man, there's something so settling. Whether you got to move, you got to move your family, or it's a new job opportunity, or, or you're, you're trying to figure out who to marry. Ask God, God, give me a scripture. Lead me by your spirit. Give me something that doesn't fade away. And God will be faithful to give it to you. The third and final point is stay unoffended. Verses 60 through 69 says, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. It's like having like a bunch of like toddlers around you all the time, right? So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the son of man ascend to heaven again? The spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that is why I said that the people, that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his, of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. I could imagine Peter in this moment thinking about all the things that he saw Jesus do and he's seeing everybody turn away. I don't know about you, but it's really easy to follow a crowd. And when the crowd starts to go away from Jesus because they didn't understand what he was saying, Peter was stuck in this moment where he had to ask himself, did I catch a word from a man? Did I catch it from hearsay? Was it a game of telephone? Or did I hear the voice of God for myself? Am I willing to stand alone in a perverse and wicked generation and say, whether the world goes that way or this way, I'm standing with the way. I'm standing with Jesus and I'm going where he's telling me to go. I don't care what my friends say. I don't care what they're counseling me to do. God, it's about me and you. You alone hold the words of eternal life. My wife and I have a friend who, a couple of friends, they're going through a really rough situation in their marriage right now. Years of infidelity kind of just all blew up in their face a little while ago. And to the woman's credit who's in this relationship, she's like, I'm trying my best. I'm trying to do everything God's way but I'm weary and I'm not feeling a breakthrough. Like 
like he, the husband is even changing and repenting, but her heart is so hardened and so callous by, by what she went through. She's like, I don't have any feelings for this guy anymore. What do I do? Because the Bible says I have grounds for divorce. And I want to just honor my wife because my wife gave this, this woman such a strong word of counsel because my wife could have went the way of the world. She could have said, you know what, for the sake of not losing a friendship, I'm going to withhold the truth from you. But my, my wife was willing to say the word that might offend for this woman's sake and for her marriage's sake. And my wife challenged her and said, well, what do you, what do you really want? What do you really want? Do you want the easy way out or do you want a God-sized story of redemption? And are you, willing to, are you willing to go the distance? Are you willing to go the distance? I'll tell you what, to our friend's credit, because she could have heard that word, she could have heard that word about sticking it out, not going the way that she felt like she deserved. I'll tell you what, the thing about bitterness that's really interesting is bitterness justifies itself. She humbled herself and she was willing to say, you know what? I knew the Holy Spirit had me ask you for a reason. A lot of people feel like God has abandoned them and God is no longer speaking, but, the, but God, is, God never abandons and he never forsakes. But what happens is we abandon and we forsake. We become offended by what he says, whether it's regarding healing or deliverance or marriage or the exclusivity of Jesus being the one way to the Father, or what his design is for marriage and sexuality, or what his design is for the sanctity of life in the womb, and all these things that the culture, that the culture is fighting about. And what God is looking for is a people that will say, will you just trust me that everything in this book is for your best? And the heart that can stay unoffended, let me tell you, will stand and will stay directed in a deceived culture. Father, we thank you that your words are life, not death. They're not death, but life. And it's also a double-edged sword and it cuts and it hurts and it corrects and it sharpens and it shapes and it removes the fat and every jagged edge of our lives, but God, your word is life. And I pray, Father, that we would be a church that's not dependent on signs, that we would be a church that's addicted to the bread of your word and the wine of your Holy Spirit and can stay unoffended as you direct us in a culture that tells us that you are worthy of being offended by. Father, Father, we thank you that your, your word declares that your desire is to preserve us in these days but open our spiritual ears. May we not follow the voice of a counterfeit, but may we follow our true shepherd until you return in Jesus name. Now, before I say amen, I wanna give an opportunity for anybody in here. Actually, I'll just ask you to stand to your feet. Let's just stand to our feet right now. I'll tell you what, the first time I ever heard the voice of God I was in high school. I wasn't even a believer. I was basically, I was borderline an atheist at that point. And I, I had this thought, I was in a hotel room and I had this thought and I said, I was just thinking about spiritual things. And I said, if God was real, then how come all of these miracles that we read about in the Bible, how come we don't see these things happen in everyday life? And the, the, <laughs> the Lord spoke to me in that moment while I was an unbeliever, and he said, because nobody believes me. You better believe that was a seed planted in my spirit. I, was, I didn't even run after God in that moment. That was a seed planted in my spirit that he is aware, he is here, he has a plan, but he's looking for people that will come to him in faith. I wanna to talk to someone in here who's struggling with directionlessness. I want to talk to somebody in here who's wandering. I want to talk to a Christian, 
even a Christian, not just unbelievers, this is for unbelievers too, but even Christians who have, who have drifted away from hearing the voice of God on a day-to-day -day basis. And let me tell you, there is more for you. There is absolutely more. Jesus paid a high price for you and for me to hear the voice of God on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, he actually created you for relationship with you. He created you to have communication with you. He created you to talk to you and to dialogue with you. But people like you and me, we said, no, tough on that. We want to do life our own way. We want all the benefits of the kingdom without the king. So we rejected God. We rebelled against God. We broke his law and we condemned ourselves because of our, of our rebellion. And the Bible's clear. The wages of our sin is death not just in this life, but in the life to come. Hell is a real place. It's not a metaphor, it's not a symbol, but Jesus came down from, planet, from heaven to planet Earth to become the sacrificial lamb for you and for me for our sin. He was brutally murdered on our behalf. He was put on a cross, nailed, nails in his wrists and in his feet. He was tortured for you and for me. And guess what? The Bible says, he declares out of his mouth while he's being crucified, Father, why have you forsaken me? The Son of God was willing to go through what you and I deserve, being separated from God, that you might come back into alignment with relationship with God and hear his voice for yourself. Jesus was put in the tomb after he breathed his last breath, but he rose from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit on the third day. And now the Holy Spirit roams the earth, knocking on hearts, saying, who has the faith to hear the voice of God? Who has the faith to respond to God's voice? And here's my encouragement to you today. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've committed. I don't care what your past looks like. Jesus can turn it all around in a moment. He can make you born again. Come to him with your wickedness. Come to him with your filth, and he will make you white as snow. But he's looking for faith to respond to his voice. And if that's you, here's what I want you to do. As the band plays, I want you to come forward. I want you to stand up at the altar right here. I'm gonna lead you in such a simple prayer. And the power is the words that we give you with the genuineness of your heart. Those two things coming together, that's gonna reconnect you with the Father in heaven who's calling you home today. And that's you, I want you to come forward right now as the band plays. Church, be praying for those people.